chapter uh, so one. Uh, Professor Swan, to uh, extend the warm welcome on behalf of the Department of Political Science as well as the uh, Department. Please. Yeah, uh, Professor Venkatesu, yeah, it's uh, a pleasure and a signal honor for our department uh, that Professor Chris uh, Weibel has uh, agreed to speak to the MS students and the uh, you know student at Lars uh, and some of the invited faculties are also joining us. So it's a matter of delight that uh, he would be able to bear his uh, scholarship on the course that Professor Venkatesu is teaching. I think the work that uh, Professor Webel and Guess is very, very important and politically salient, especially as India confront the worst uh, medical uh, you know, crisis uh, in, in a very, very long time. So uh, prob probably the worst ever crisis that we have faced. I think one of the uh, works that uh, I glean from uh, the CV of Professor Webel is uh, quite extensive. I am quite impressed with uh, the kind of works that he does. And uh, the, the kind of policy framework, the advocacy, the coalition uh, advocacy policy framework, in effect, is very, very important part in foregrounding, you know, some of the important uh, public policies uh, which, in effect, elevate extensively issues of health, issues of poverty, or issues of welfare in uh, not only in the West, but also in the developing countries, including in India. So one of the clearest instances of the way in which uh, coalition policy advocacy works out to elevate issues of health, issues of poverty, or issues of uh, you know uh, education and others, for example, is uh, what what we called the uh, the uh, National uh, uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Act in recent time, or the Right to Information Act, which in effect uh, brought about greater transparency as well as accountability in the way public institutions function. It is altogether a different matter that some of these outcomes, policy outcomes of coalition policy advocacy framework has stumbled upon or has numerous policy gridlocks thanks uh, to uh, the not so transparent, the opaque uh, way in which some of our government function today. But but the, the, the possibility that this coalition advocacy policy framework has done a transformative change in the way we look at governance and the way governance is uh, enacted out in terms of efficient, quick delivery of public services is something which is often always looked up to. And we hope that uh, uh, the lecture by Professor Chris would throw significant light of our understanding on the way this work out and illuminate our understanding on the subject. So Chris, it's uh, again a pleasure as well as a delight and signal honor for all of us. We take great pleasure and thank you so much for agreeing to speak and the floor is yours. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just let me introduce. Uh, uh, see, the uh, public policy course in the Department of Political Science, it has been in existence for the last two, few decades. However, the today's event is going to be one of the landmark uh, event big, uh, uh, in the history of the uh, public policy of our department. Uh, is because uh, uh, the obvious reason is that uh, we have the original proponent, one of the original proponents of this theory, advocacy coalition uh, framework. So that is the obvious uh, reason. And that uh, we know the Professor Christopher Webel has been product of uh, University of Washington and then uh, 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 University of California for his uh, higher education and he is a multi-dimensional academician. He has been performing multi-dimensional tasks as a researcher, as a director for the research program, PhD program 
and he has been extensively contributing in the form of writings both publication of the books as well as the uh, journals and another recent one of the major achievement of professor webul is becoming co editor policy and politics journal which is one of the world renowned journal which has got a top rank journal in the world today so we having such a distinguished academician is our privilege of the privilege of our department and christopher webul has agreed during this uh, uh, crisis despite having busy schedule uh, to address our students because today you know very well that uh, it was berald d laswell who has uh, introduced the concept of the policy sciences and then policy cycle approach and over a period of time we can come across in the literature of public policy analysis the series of frameworks approaches new trends uh, have been uh, coming up one of the major landmark uh, uh, framework that have probably started in the uh, just uh, just before the end of 1980s uh, that is the uh, advocacy coalition framework uh, with the uh, uh, by, written by three important scholars one is uh, uh, paul a sebatier christopher m webel and jenkins smith so that is the beginning of the advocacy coalition framework while making a critic critic, critic uh, on policy cycle approach so here is the the original proponent of uh, one of the theory, one of the original proponent of the theory to speak so i am not much interested to speak about the advocacy coalition framework we are here to listen to you so we want to give the sufficient uh, probably this time the uh, from now it is about to 9:40 to 11:30 are having the time and it is uh, over to professor uh, webel mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Professor Venkatsu. I hope I said that right. I, I probably didn't, but thank you so much. And also thank you so much, Dr. Swan, for the nice uh, introduction too. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and, and thank you for the invitation and thank you for showing up. I, I do have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation. Can I share my screen? Is that possible? Yeah. Can you? Please go and, ahead. Uh, let's see if I can share your screen. Oops, I want to switch this around. Yeah, looks excellent. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah we can see. Can we see? can see. Yeah, yeah, oh, it, it oh, looks good. great. Yeah, it looks fine. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to hear that, and thank you for telling yeah. me. Um, I have I have quite a few slides on the advocacy coalition framework, um, and also I'd be very happy to take your questions. I mean, I, I know sometimes um, when we do these PowerPoint presentations you know, on, on, on Zoom or any type of, of, of you know, virtual, uh, virtual presentation like this, it's hard to ask questions, it's hard to engage. But please um, do so, I'll pause periodically if you have questions. And um, I'll try to keep an eye on my, um, my um, <laughs> Google uh, uh, Meet, Google dot um, platform also, but, um, but please interact with me because I, I I can do this talk by myself, and so what makes it interesting, of course, is is being with you. So um, um, so let I'll get started. But yeah, I have a, a talk about the advocacy collision framework. My name is Chris Weibel. I've been um, gosh working with this framework for over well over twenty years, as was mentioned. Um, it was originally designed by Paul Sabatier. And as, as far back as 1982, so it's been around for about 30 years. And Hank Jenkins Smith um, joined soon after. Um, and yes, I'm with the School of Public Affairs at the University of Colorado, Denver now. Um, you know, we're, we always welcome visitors if anybody wants to come. And I also co-direct the workshop on policy process research, which is turning, in, turning into the Center for Policy and Democracy. Um, but that's kind of um, 
the, the groups that I'm associated with. Um, I do call myself a public policy scholar. I promote a lot of different policy theories. I work with a lot of theories, but the Advocacy Coalition Framework or the ACF is often where I um, kind of always kind of go back to. It's what I spend a lot of my time on. Let's see if I can get this thing going. Oh, there we go. I'm going to start off by um, talking about some aspects of the creation of the ACF and some of the, the ideas that were circulating in the early 1980s. And it's kind of important to know this, um, what it was like, especially in, um, in policy scholarship in the 1980s um, in, the, in the US that helped um, kind of create this framework. And one, which was actually mentioned earlier was, you know, back in, you know, at that time period, um, you know, the policy cycle was and it still is to some extent, but it definitely was back then a, a dominant lens by which um, people often viewed the policy process and the policy cycle being um, almost like, like the, the, um, the life period of a policy. So like how issues get on the agenda, how they're formulated, adopted, implemented, evaluated, sometimes terminated. And, and that was a, a dominant lens. It often is, it's a good lens. There's nothing wrong with it. Paul Sabatier was very critical of it. Um, I'm less critical of it. it. It is a good lens to have, but it should not be your only way of viewing the policy process. But what the ACF did provide is a more of, of a dynamic conflict-based depiction of the policy process involving these dueling coalitions, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, second, you know, Back then, too, there was also a, a, very, a tendency to have a very narrow depiction of like actors, people involved in the policy process. Um, and, and, um, and oftentimes it just involved, let's say, government agencies or, or it did not involve scientists or may involve what was often termed the Iron Triangle, maybe an administrative agency, maybe a, a committee in our Congress in the United States maybe um, an interest group. And, um, you know, when they designed the ACF, they observed that there were a lot more, you know, other organizations involved in the policy process and not just the ones that were often studied. And so they realized that they wanted to expand, you know, um, the set of actors to any, to just study anybody. It could be scientists, news media, judges sometimes, or could be part of this process that we're looking at. And um, then came the question of how do you organize this big group of people um, or big groups of organizations? And, and, you know, as they were looking at conflict, they realized that these organizations tended to form coalitions. And that became um, the unit for analyzing and collecting these organizations um, for study, but also it represented what was going on in politics. If you think about it, anytime there's conflict, usually people choose sides. And that's exactly what this is uh, trying to pick up, is the tendency to form these sides, these teams, or whatever we want to call it, um, in politics. Um, and also, it also dawned on um, Paul Sabatier and Hank Jenkins Smith back then, that a lot of studies at the time that involved public policy tended to focus on, let's say, the, uh, a single government agency as the unit of analysis. And they realized that if you really want to understand public policy, it's really important to kind of open that up because, because we realize that oftentimes when public policy is implemented, it involves multiple government agencies, um, often at different levels of government, if you're in a federal system like in India or the US, and, 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 and so they, they pulled in this idea of the policy subsystem, which is um, basically like a subset. I, I like the term subsystem because it does remind us it's a subset of the, essentially the political system that focuses on a policy area. And, you know, and sub policy subsystems are things, you know, they exist. Usually they're anchored to administrative agency. It's where all the coalitions kind of interact but they're also can be very nested in a, in a political system. And, and, you know, and this is, a, you know, one way of thinking about it where I'm from, 
Um, like you might have, a, you know, I live in the city of Denver um, and we have a water policy subsystem and that's nested within a Colorado water policy subsystem, which is nested in a broader a Colorado River Basin policy subsystem, which is kind of nested within the U.S. Um, United States water system. I'm sure you can probably think of similar arrangements in India too. And this is more of a nested vertical arrangement of subsystems, but you can also imagine it going horizontal also. So a Denver, uh, or like a Colorado water policy subsystem might overlap, intersect with say the agricultural subsystem in the state or, uh, or similar subsystems. Um, but the thing is, is that when we think about these subsystems, um, you know, they are partly anchored to like the specialists, they're anchored to uh, government agencies, but, and so they, they exist in that regard, but also we, we partly interpret them. We talk to people, we, we almost kind of um, determine the boundaries from the, almost from the, the, the ground up, almost in an inductive way. Um, and because usually people involved in subsystems know the boundaries themselves. So if you talk to them, they'll say, oh yeah, these are the people that are involved in the subsystem. These are kind of the, the boundaries and often the boundaries are jurisdictional even to make that sim more simple. Um, but the subsystem is one of the hardest things that can be a hard thing to identify. Sometimes there's not a subsystem and sometimes there is and, and subsystem, one subsystem um, that might exist, let's say in the United States might not exist in India. And so it is something that needs to be contextually driven when you do your analysis. Um, another um, problem that, that emerged in, in the 1980s that uh, Sabatier was responding to was overlooking um, just the role of information in analytical debates. Uh, there wasn't a lot of research at the time on that. And so he really wanted to bring in this focus on learning and the role of scientific and technical information. And I think we've also learned now that, you know, it's not just scientific, scientific and technical information. It's also just, just, just really just sometimes it's local knowledge. Sometimes it's a lot of different types of information um, that can be really uh, important in these kind of um, debates. But the ACF has a heavy focus on that. And finally, um, you know, there was concerns about temporality, maybe taking a short-term time perspective. And the framework was designed to really emphasize, you know, long-term perspectives. You know, often they say 10 years or more, um, but, you know, sometimes studies, it's not practical to do that either. Um, but usually, you know, it does have that kind of long-term time perspective. Um, I guess I'm just gonna pause for a little bit. Is there, are there any questions or comments that people like to put out there about what I've said so far? Am I talking too fast? Um, any um, comments, doing okay? If not, I'll keep going. Uh, Chris, you are doing fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're doing fine. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Dr. Uh, Professor Swan. I'm going to keep moving on. Um, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the design of the um, Advocacy Coalition Framework, and I'll get into more depths in all these areas um, soon also. But the design, typically, we, you know, it is a, a framework that deals with individuals as, let's say, the agents of change. And these individuals are said to be really motivated by what's been called a belief system. And there's basically three levels to this belief system, and I'll talk about this a lot in a little bit. Um, deep core beliefs, which are your fundamental kind of normative beliefs, like almost like your identity, who you are. Uh, policy core beliefs, which relate to kind of general policy positions in the subsystem that you're in and secondary beliefs, which um, are, are much more narrower than the policy core beliefs. So one way of thinking of policy core and secondary beliefs, and I'll talk about this more, is policy core beliefs are often, let's say your goals of this in the subsystem and your secondary beliefs are often your means or, or how you will achieve those goals. Um, but basically we have individuals uh, with those belief systems um, they tend to coordinate with people with some other similar beliefs. And, and you put those together, the, the shared beliefs and that coordination, you get an advocacy coalition. And in some settings, especially in, in, in open democratic settings uh, with sufficient resources, 
make it an, an, an opposing advocacy coalition. But even right here, like I, I'll talk about this more too, sometimes you don't have two coalitions. You may sometimes you just have one dominant advocacy coalition. And, and, and oftentimes it's like a minor or like um, really a, a minority coalition without a lot of power at all. And, that, and they're not very well organized. And this, is, this comes into really the setup of the political system and the subsystems and how they look. We don't always have two coalitions. And in these coalitions, get in debates, they, they, they argue, argue, they tell stories and try to counter each other. They venue shop, meaning they try to achieve their objectives and different aspects of the political system. They try to win, basically. And, um, and of course, these, these coalitions exist in the subsystem that I was talking about before. Um, and this could be at the city level or at a state level or at the national level. It depends on um, the nature of the problem, but also the, even the structure of the governing system. So, for example, and you know, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in India, obviously, but if I'm sure there's subsystems at the state level and at the national level, um, and maybe in some situations at the local level, um, and you know, these subsystems are um, structured by um, long-term, come long-term opportunity structures. Um, this involves um, aspects of, of um, you know, let's say there might be. And in some systems, there might be different rules for uh, what it takes for negotiating policy change, be it consensus in the example I'm giving. Um, some of the subsystems are more open in, in than others in the, in the political system. And, um, and also there's short-term constraints. Sometimes there's more resources at one point in time than others, and sometimes it can vary over time. And, you know, every subsystem set within the ACF calls it stable, ex, you know, external parameters, but these are, you can almost think of these as country level um, factors, uh, the social structure, distribution of resources, like the constitution of India, the culture of India, the basic attributes of the problem, like the basic geographical aspects of the country of India that's very distinct from the US. And those would kind of fall into the stable parameters. And of course, there's also these external events, which are more dynamic. Oh, another way of, you know, the word, we have the word stable external. This is external to the subsystem and, and, and stable means that they're generally, they don't change a lot over time, although sometimes they can change, especially te technological change, or sometimes the environmental, the environment can change a lot. But these are, these are aspects of the, let's say, of the country of India that really are kind of generally stable over time. And these are more the dynamic aspects of, of let's say, the country that could be elections, it could be changes in opinion, could be uh, changes in the economy that are a little more, perhaps more dynamic that can affect the subsystem. And so it, it, the framework does distinguish between the stable and the, um, and the more dynamic events. Both are external. And of course, there's all these arrows that kind of draw everything together. And, and, and what I'm, you know, this diagram I showed right here is basically the same thing you'll find in almost any textbook of the ACF, where you have the subsystem on the right with uh, uh, you know coalition this and this example coalition A and coalition B, and like I said, it does not need to always have two coalitions. Sometimes there could be three coalitions. Sometimes there's one dominant coalition and a small minority coalition. Um, they have beliefs and resources. They engage in strategies. They try to influence government. And through the government, they try to change here it's the institutional rules like change the policy, and then, you know, that leads to outputs and impacts that reinforce the subsystem, but also affect the broader system. And of course, there's feedback loops too. But this is the general structure of the framework that um, it's been modified a little bit over time, but it's basically the same as it was back in the 80s. And it's proved quite um, um, beneficial too. And, you know, and, and, and when we think of the ACF, um, what you want to think about, which is important, is the ACF is a framework. And I'm going to say framework, I, I mean this in the, um, in the tradition often described by um, uh, the late Eleanor Ostrom. It's basically a, 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 a platform that has assumptions and concepts and vocabulary in terms of concepts and kind of lays out general associations like I just did. I just laid out the framework of the, the ACF. 
But within this framework, there's also theoretical emphases, almost like there's theories within the framework. And the ACF is known for its theories of coalitions, which I've talked a little bit about, a theory that, that emphasize learning, and a theory essentially of policy change. And, and, and one way of thinking about this is like, I often think of the framework almost like your, like your mobile phone, your iPhone, basically. And, and the theories are almost like the apps that can be uploaded on the phone. And the ACF is essentially like a framework, it's a hard drive, and you can upload basically the three theories here of coalitions, learning, and change. But you can also possibly upload other theories, and, and, and especially if they're consistent with the framework. Um, and it's also important to recognize that the framework itself is, is fairly portable. Like I, I like to think that the framework of the ACF, like the idea of subsystems, the idea that you know a coalition may form or two coalitions may form, um, some of the basic concepts of the ACF are very portable. I like to think that they're, they're portable to India and parts of India. However, the theoretical description of coalitions will differ in India. Maybe patterns of learning will differ in India and actually patterns of policy change. All these things will differ. So the, oops, it's the theories that are adaptable. And so it would be great to see would be India, Indian scholars taking the framework and, and as, as something that's portable, the, the language that the framework provides and really adapt and, and, and develop the theories to fit to the Indian context. Um, and, and, and once that happens, then we can start comparing, because oh, ideally we'd have the same vocabulary, what coalitions look like, let's say in India compared to the US, compared to South Korea, or other countries. But, but that's what's, for me, that's what's exciting about the framework actually, is, is I, I get to work with scholars like yourself maybe in the future, but also, I mean, uh, and scholars elsewhere, but also we can start developing a, um, a, a, shared understanding, a shared understanding of what the framework looks at, like the subsystems, coalitions, learning, policy change, and start learning from each other. And that's what I really like about it, because it helps me do comparative research. Um, now, I don't necessarily do the research, but I work with scholars who apply it in different countries and I learn about those countries and learn more about my country too. Okay, so I'm, um, one more thing. Oops, there's only four points, not five. Um, a few more points about applying the framework and then I'm gonna dive into those different um, theoretical emphases. One, there's many ways to apply it. And, and that's really important to know. Like a lot of people say, you know, have asked me is well, how do you apply this this framework? And and the good thing and the bad thing about the ACF is that there's multiple ways to apply it. Yeah, and and there and there are some um, good surveys out there, um, good examples of coding approaches for text. But but there is a lot of different ways you can apply it and and, and adapt it to your setting. And, and therefore, it can also like I right right here. Um, support many different forms of, of data. And like I was talking about before, you can also upload different theoretical ideas into it. Um, and so it does provide a lot of flexibility, but ideally a structure, they would enable research teams to communicate each other and to learn from each other. Um, so as I said, the framework is fairly portable. Its theories are designed to be adaptable. So it's against a framework that has theories underneath it. And those theories are meant to be adaptable to those contexts. And, and any, any of this should be um, uh, uh, driven by a deep understanding of your context. And so, you know, the framework is not meant to be applied blindly and, uh, and ignoring, let's say, you know, whatever the, the subsystem characteristics of your setting, let's say in India and, and, and let's say you're, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not you know, totally up on all and all the kind of the controversies in India right now, but I have been somewhat aware of the, the protests by a lot of the farmers and agriculture in the country. You'd have to know a lot about that agricultural um, the protests and, and, and the issues related to ags, agriculture and farming in India to understand this framework and apply it. And I would be very kind of um, hesitant to do that without really diving into that and understanding it myself. Um, no need to apply the whole framework. Some people just apply the coalitional part. Some people just apply the policy change and, and just a little bit of the coalitions. And so really you can apply, it is a framework where you, you can kind of pull out what you want to pull out and um, 
apply it to suit your objectives. And finally, and of course, we always say be as transparent as possible because we are here to learn from each other. And the more transparent we can be, the better off we'll be uh, in terms of advancing the science and so forth. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about coalitions, but let me pause again. Um, are there any questions or comments? Are we doing okay? Um, um, I, should I go over something a little bit more? I was going to talk a little bit about coalitions. I was going to talk a little bit about learning and policy change coming up. Are we doing okay? Any questions or comments? Feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat area. If not, I will continue. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. I wanna talk a, a bit about coalitions. Oops. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, coalitions are, you know, when I say policy actors, I mean, you know, it's just a concept. It's anything, that, you know, excuse me, relates to people or organizations that are engaged in the policy process to some extent. And, and sometimes it could be a scientist publishing in the subsystem that shapes the narrative. It could be a news media that's also kind of reporting on subsystem activities and, and, and contributing to the general understanding of the subsystem. It could be government officials, interest groups, businesses, and so forth. Um, these policy actors, um, you know, they share beliefs, um, they coordinate behavior, as I said, and they engage in various political activities. Um, and using resources to achieve their goals. That's what a coalition is. But the question is, okay, that's how we imagine a coalition to be. And of course, that imagination we have is based on empirical evidence, but how do we actually study this stuff? And, and that's kind of a good, good question. And also, what's the, how do we imagine these coalitions um, acting in the world? And what hypotheses do we have that relates to coalitions? And, and I'm not going to, I will show the hypotheses of the ACF, and I'm not going to, well, I might read this word for word, but the ACF does have a general kind of, uh, you know, I, I describe it here as an archetypical depiction or story about coalitions um, that's under the ACF. And, and this little paragraph is basically um, a compilation of the hypotheses that the ACF has about coalitions all put together into like almost like a little story. And the story is basically that, hey, in open democratic systems, when these policy actors perceive threats to their policy values, um, they'll form coalitions and they'll, these will include government and non-government entities. Like I said, scientists, to the news media, to interest groups, to businesses. Um, oftentimes government officials will take more moderate views than their interest group allies. Um, given the normative underpinnings of these, these groups, because these coalitions are formed by these beliefs, fundamentally driven by the deep core beliefs, which are your kind of like, it's almost visceral, these kind of deep, deep kind of identity-based beliefs that aren't really that reliable to change, but also it's kind of who you are. And because these beliefs are just kind of so like kind of part of your identity, they remain stable over extended periods of time. And therefore coalitions also remain relatively stable. And it's not like, you know, change doesn't happen. Sometimes we change beliefs, but, you know, more likely you're gonna change, like say your secondary beliefs, and that is beliefs about how you might achieve your goals, you're going to change that more frequently than you will um, your goals themselves. And, and so we do, we do think that those kind of the means will change more than the ends, but change is possible. Um, and the exception also might be uh, people that, you know, because not everyone's like super attached to a subsystem. Some people just are on the periphery and they may change their beliefs a little bit more. Um, ACF, sometimes we study material groups. These are groups that are motivated, motivated more by profit. We've noticed that sometimes they change their beliefs a little bit more on policy issues because as long as they keep achieving those profits, they don't quite care as much about the policy. And, um, and uh, you know, given the tendency to, you know, the goal is to translate these beliefs into policies, engage in all kinds of, of, of strategies to achieve their goals. This is generally the story of, of, of coalitions under the ACF. Um, the, I see the archetypical story. And I think you do see exceptions to the story. It doesn't always play out this way. Um, and I, I do think, you know, I often wonder, you know, if, if you were to create a story, let's say in the country of India or in another part of the world, would it look the same? I don't know. 
But this is, um, when we think of the ACF, when you tell the ACF story, this is it. And oftentimes our research go, uh, tries to either refute or confirm aspects of the story. And, and then that's where, you know, sorry for the blurriness here. And if you open up any ACF book, you'll find basically uh, these five hypotheses. They've been around since 1980 something, 1986. And, and these stories basically say this, these hypotheses essentially tell the same story that I just told you about the stability of secondary beliefs compared to policy core beliefs, um, about the stability of coalitions over time. I just told it more in a little paragraph than, than these five hypotheses that don't really kind of interact as much as I would like them to. Um, but these hypotheses uh, are basically embedded in this little paragraph. And also what's good about this too is that sometimes people think that you got to apply these hypotheses. And yeah, I mean, they're good to apply. I mean, I often apply them myself. But sometimes, you know, you, it's, it's important to know more of the spirit underlying the hypotheses and the logic, which I think is told better in the paragraph I just said. And that part gives you a little more freedom to adapt the, the hypotheses to your context a little bit more. And, and sometimes... Um, um, you know, you might have data, for example, that might um, be very um, consistent with what the ACF or that, that allows you to test a, a hypothesis that's very um, consistent with the ACF, but maybe slightly different than these five, but kind of still theoretically consistent with what it might expect. And that's why it's sometimes it's good to kind of think, yeah, to recognize these hypotheses, but don't necessarily be bound by them as something that you must always test because there's a lot of ways you can analyze coalitions and explore coalitions under the ACF and not just through these five hypotheses. Um, you know, so one of the lessons we've kind of learned, yeah, at, you know, coalitions, yeah, they exist. Sometimes they don't exist in some, some subsystems, especially when there's no conflict at all, but yeah, we'll find them everywhere. Um, and, you know, many of the traditional hypotheses have been confirmed, like that our typical story have been confirmed, but there's notable exceptions. Sometimes the policy core beliefs change more than the secondary beliefs. And so, so there are some exceptions, but what we're lacking right now is understanding why those exceptions happen and trying to put them into um, a, a kind of contextualize these hypotheses so we, so we know when they work and they don't work. Um, you know, one hypothesis that emerged over time was this belief homophily hypothesis. That is the tendency for people to coordinate with shared beliefs. It's almost like a definitional hypothesis of coalitions. A lot of people are out there looking at, you know, what, you know, to what extent do these core, these policy core beliefs drive coordination, drive coalitional behavior. And yes, for the most part, it always does. What's interesting is that you, if you bring up the conflict level, um, the policy core beliefs become more and more important. So the higher the conflict, the more likely you are to interact with people with shared beliefs. If you lower the conflict, the more likely you are not to worry about interacting with someone you disagree with. So in other words, if you're, in, uh, if you're working on a policy issue and you don't feel threatened by your opponent, you're more likely to work with that opponent. And that's something that we're also kind of finding in some of the data. Um, in another lesson, it's, it's difficult to verify um, that, you know, aspects of coalitional um, behavior or coalitional structure by the, essentially the political system. So, for example, we know that well, we have a good suspicion that coalitions will differ, for example, in their structure and their behavior in India compared to the U.S. But we're not quite, we don't, it's hard to predict or try, it's hard to kind of develop um, a good explanation of what that will be without like doing a lot of research. And, um, and finally, there's many, many ways to measure coalitions and each has its strengths and limitations. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. But these are some of the lessons we've learned over time. Um, you know, methodologically, I know if you want to study at co coalitions, like I said, there's a lot of different data sources. A lot of, you know, surveys remain a really good source. If you can do a survey online or, or paper, um, if you want. Um, there's no agreed upon way how to measure um, these survey, like how to actually measure, like write the question about measuring a coalition. But there's a lot of instruments available. And if anybody would like to see instruments, I'd be very happy to email you um, examples of them, or you can just find them. They're available 
if you were to look online. A lot of people have done a hand coding of testimonies and hearings. Um, Paul Sabatier did a lot of that work and same with Hank Jenkins Smith. And that's still a very common way of doing this. Uh, although nowadays we're doing more and more automation or semi-automation of, of, of this text. Um, lately we're doing a lot more new, oops, excuse me, a lot more news media coding using discourse network analysis. Uh, and if you, you know, look, look at uh, Philip Lightfield's work from 2013, Good place to start. You know, I've done some of this work too with um, my colleague Tanya Heikula in a publication in 2019. But discourse network analysis is just a way of basically pulling from text how people relate based on their common frames or beliefs as expressed in that text. And, and we've done a lot of this in the news media. And what's nice about the news media is that a lot of countries have the news media. It's, it, obviously, it's a it's not the best source of information because it's reported by a journalist and so forth, but it's so you can get it over time and you can also get it across countries. So it's, it's actually kind of nice in, in some aspects of that. Um, here's one of my PhD students, Dallas Elgin, that's Elgin right there. He actually analyzed coalitions based on hyperlinks. So on any website, we know there's a hyperlink from one website to another. He did a hyperlink analysis and if he identified coalitions that were confirmed with the survey um, using hyperlinks, which is another way of, like, uh, of identifying coalitions. Many people base their coalitions on interviews, which is just fine, excuse me. And, and other, of course, sometimes we just, you know, informal, observational, slash types of analyses, a lot of other ways you can do this. There's no single way to analyzing coalitions. And, and this is something that um, I really became aware of I do a lot of work on hydraulic fracturing. This is a book I published a few years ago um, as an edited book. And we looked at hydraulic fracturing, which is basically oil and gas development. Um, and, uh, and we did, a, a you know, as this chart says, we did about a, a seven country comparison with the United States, Canada, Switzerland, United Kingdom, Germany, and Sweden, and France. And, and for this analysis, we basically had scholars in each country describe the coalitions. And, uh, each of them used a different source. In Germany, they did a media analysis. In the US, we did interviews and a survey. Um, in Sweden, they just did analysis of documents. And some people analyze it qualitatively, other people analyze it quantitatively, some people did discourse network analysis. And each of them found um, a, a, so their own depiction of a coalition, but from a slightly different perspective, even though it was a different country, it was a slightly different angle on it. And the way I think of coalitions is almost like these complex entities that not one data source can completely capture. And so, but each one has, you know, a somewhat valid way of justifying that they kind of exist essentially in this particular setting. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really good to know that if you were interested in identifying coalitions, you can do it from many, many different perspectives um, or excuse me, a lot of different data sources and a lot of different what, different forms of analysis. And, um, you know, but the key again is, is to kind of know the core concepts of the, the policy core belief, the deep core beliefs and secondary beliefs, coordination, and, and identify and understand the concepts and find ways of measuring them in a transparent way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a sec too. Um, you know, in the ACF, I did talk about um, the three tier belief system deep core policy core and secondary beliefs. And, you know, you know, your deep core beliefs are your fundamental normative orientations. Your policy core beliefs are your kind of, they can be normative and empirical, but they concern the subsystem. So they, they're always anchored by, let's say, something related to the policy you're dealing with. Whereas your deep core beliefs are very like, kind of more abstract, usually uh, uh, detached from a policy. Um, and secondary beliefs are again your instrumental beliefs, oftentimes your means for achieving your goals, as I mentioned. And as you can imagine, these are just examples, but there's so many ways you can measure um, a person's belief system. And some are better than others. Um, as an example, um, let's see here. Um, you know, in the past, we've used cultural theory, uh, which is, you know, um, a theory developed by Mary Douglas and Aaron Valdosky about 30, 40 years, 30 or 40 years ago. And, and, and 
Cultural theory is a good example of a theory that can be uploaded into the ACF, just like you would put an app on your phone. And it's a very consistent theory. And, and you know, the cultural theory basically says, hey, we can understand people based on these two dimensions. People, we can understand people's belief systems or these fundamental beliefs based on these two dimensions. The grid dimension kind of describes it as someone, you know, anchored by or bound by rules. So if you're high on grid, you're high on, you can feel like you're, excuse me, I keep going, up and forward. Um, you feel like you're kind of um, controlled by external rules. And if you're negative grid, it means you're kind of more independent. And, uh, you know, if you're big on group, it means that you're kind of bound by your social network. And your long group means you're kind of more individual. And so, for example, you know, in the United States, you know, very much an individualist culture, so you can, you know, suppose as a culture itself, we're kind of here, but individualism in the United States is often associated with, say, the Republican Party and, and libertarianism. Um, you know, hierarchy would be, you know, a um, good example often is described as a Catholic church, uh, but oftentimes people who are very pro government are very hierarchical in their orientation also. Egalitarianism is more geared towards um, social equity, as an example, and fatalism basically means that. You're controlled by forces outside of you. And these are some of the survey questions we've used to kind of tackle these different um, quadrants of egalitarianism and so forth in our surveys. Um, for example, our society should be better off if the distribution of wealth were more equal or uh, egalitarian. And these are the type of just questions we've used on our surveys for measuring deep core beliefs. Hierarchism, um, the government interferes far too much in their everyday lives, so if you disagree with that, you, um, you know, you're probably more of a hierarch. Individualists, government should stop telling people how to live their lives. Fatalists, for the most part, succeeding in life is a matter of chance. Like, it's all luck. You're over there. And, you know, and, and, and these, are, these questions were actually were developed by Hank Jenkins Smith. Uh, we've used them on some of our surveys, and they work quite well, actually. Um, they're, good, they're good questions. Um, but also, you know, as I said, there's a lot of ways you can apply the ACF. Um, and, you know, cultural theory is one of them. And if you want more on cultural theory, just if you Google, on Google Scholar, cultural theory and ACF, you'll find a, a lot of examples. Um, but also sometimes we don't apply it for cultural theory. And, you know, one of our surveys in the Colorado 2017 survey we did on fracking, we didn't want to ask all those questions on cultural theory. So all we did was ask, you know, basically, what's, are you extreme liberal or extreme conservative? Which isn't the best question. But for our purposes, it worked just fine. We just didn't want to spend a lot of time on deep core beliefs. And sometimes I don't even measure deep core beliefs in all my surveys if I don't want to. You don't have to. But, um, but these are, you know, this is just the very basic question that we've asked. Um, you know, the same with policy core beliefs. These are beliefs that are kind of bound to the subsystem. So in oil and gas, we basically, it's, it's you know, a good example would be, you know, do, do you want, you know, a natural gas development that uses hydraulic fracturing to be stopped, limited, continued, expanded, moderately or expanded extensively? Do you want a lot of it or a little bit? And this is just what are some of our data looks like. You know, so, you know, you can imagine, you know, this could be for nuclear power. Do you want nuclear power to be expanded or not? Do you want a lot of this or none of this? And, and those are kind of common policy core belief questions, especially when the question at hand is, is kind of definitional to the subsystem. Um, and in this setting, you know, um, across New York, Colorado, and Texas, these are policy actors actively involved. Um, you know, we have kind of similar distributions, although in New York, there was very few people in the middle of, of the distribution. You know, all the, you know policy core just isn't about policy preferences, it's also about problems. And these, again, this is all very contextual to oil and gas, but we ask a lot of questions about things related to, to the issue. And these are, again, another measure of, of policy core belief. And finally, you know, we do, um, just getting away from measurement and more into empirical results. I worked with Wei Li, she's a scholar from Hong Kong, and we actually, well, she did the analysis of 81 applications of the ACF in China. And, you know, and, and she, you know, she looked at, okay, what changed? And, you know, she found that, you know, it kind of confirmed a lot of the expectations of the ACF that all secondary beliefs 
change the most and didn't change the least. All core beliefs change moderately and didn't change sometimes. Deep core beliefs rarely changed and a lot most of the time didn't change. Well, what's important, so this confirms the hypothesis, but what is important is that it's not always the, the case, right? There's some situations where policy square beliefs do change. Um, and there's some situations where, where secondary beliefs don't change. But the, but the pattern is, 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 um, is confirmatory. So again, with people and, and politics, of course, and everything else, there isn't ironclad rules that always play out. But this is the general um, confirmation, at least in China, of the structure of the belief system and how we would expect it to operate. But this also raises questions about the exceptions. What about these five cases of changes in deep core beliefs um, in, in China? You know, these, this is a, would be five publications that reported changes in deep core beliefs. Why, you know, why did these things change? And, and that's something that we need to pay more attention to going forward with, and that would be the exceptions of the rule and not just confirmation of the, of the rule or the exceptions to our hypotheses, not just the confirmations of them. And if anybody would like any of the, these, these um, publications that I mentioned or, or surveys or anything like that I'm presenting here, please email me. I'd be very happy to share. Um, you know, the, the, the good part of the, the, the coalitions are involves coordination. And oftentimes people separate you know, strong coordination, which is like, you know, actually developing plans and working them out, to come more kind of weak coordination, which is basically the idea of just sort of uh, knowing that you have allies doing certain activities over there, but you're maybe not um, coordinating with, coordinate with them directly, but you're kind of playing off each other a little bit and, and, and understanding the niche that you're in. Or maybe it's just kind of basically like, um, you know, maybe it's sharing information somehow. Um, but it's a little bit not quite as, as, as strong, uh, as it, uh, it's not quite as um, deliberate as a strong coordination. But the most important here is that, you know, the funny thing with strong and weak coordination, I don't know that many studies at all that really distinguish between strong and weak coordination. For the most part, people just analyze who they coordinate with and who they collaborate with. And they don't get into the details that's on the slide. And, you know, you, I'm sure you've seen all these little network maps. These are just two of them based on the discourse network analysis that I mentioned earlier, where we basically analyze um, uh, coordination via um, different organizations. Um, this one is done through actually narrative policy framework where we identify heroes, villains, victims to identify the coalitions. And uh, this was done in Germany. Um, People have used a lot of different network analysis techniques to identify coalitions. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, happy to dive into it. Oftentimes people are given a roster of different names and they pick who they coordinate on that roster. What's so like, do you, do you, did you coordinate with them? Yes or no. Other times they're just given an open-ended question of, hey, who do you collaborate with on this issue? And, and they'll give, um, you know, let's maybe write in of a few of the names of the organizations they, they, they collaborate with. And, and then you can develop your network maps. Again, there's many ways to do it. Um, and I can flash up a lot of different network maps if I wanted to. Um, but, it, but it is, uh, um, you know, one can think about identifying coalitions that there's a lot of different ways you can draw these pictures and, and pull out this information. Um, and some people have asked, okay, so do these, do these people even know that they're in a coalition? And there has been two, I've been, Two of my studies this past decade, I've actually asked people directly, like in 2013, me in Dallas and um, the climate change subsystem in Colorado, we asked, you know, if they uh, participated in a coalition. And uh, most people said, yeah, they do this every year. And, and me and Tanya Heikla also asked people, you know, if they spent a lot of time forming and maintaining a coalition with allies, we just asked the direct question. So instead of trying to get a coalition indirectly, so sometimes we measure beliefs, we measure who they share information from, or who they collaborate with. From here, we kind of almost go uh, build um, from the bottom up what these coalitions look like without them even knowing that they're in a coalition. Um, but here we just ask directly, hey, are you in a coalition? And most people said they were. Um, what, what, often what often happens here is that sometimes if you ask a scientist if they're in a coalition, 
they'll say, no, I'm not. But if you ask them who they share the information with, there's very distinct patterns of who they share their information with. So sometimes they're not even aware of it, especially for scientists. And sometimes for government officials too, they don't quite know they're in a coalition. Uh, but for the most part, at least according to th these two studies, people are self-aware of it. Not everyone, but a good number of people, at least in these two settings. Let's see how am I doing here? So I'm, I have learning and policy change, which are shorter, but uh, can, should, I, should I keep going or, or uh, or is there questions about what I've done so far? We're doing okay? Yes, Kiran, do you have any question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. yeah. Hello, uh, Professor Bengal. Uh, actually, I'm Kiran, a doctoral uh, scholar in the Department of Political Science. Actually, I missed uh, uh, International Spring School on Public Policy Denver edition of 2018 due to okay. logistics uh, issues. But oh, I'm grateful to listen to you today. And uh, I'm, uh, as Professor Venkatesh introduced you and your text, uh, uh, we are able to uh, concentrate more on uh, coalition advocacy more. But my question is uh, related to something related to uh, how we can uh, theoretically differentiate between uh, coalition and uh, networks. So uh, it may be common beliefs in um, coalitions, but uh, uh, there are networks can be uh, formed uh, not only based on common beliefs, but uh, different other uh, things also matters in networks. But is there any other differentiation between these coalitions uh, from the theoretical framework, difference between the coalitions and the networks? So, so I'm gonna, uh, first of all, uh, um, uh, Kumar, I think I, uh, Good. Um, actually, it's good to uh, be acquainted with you, and, uh, um, and thanks for the question. If I'm understanding this right, um, you're asking, is there another way to distinguish these coalitions outside of beliefs? Is that, is that, is that the question? Did I say that right? Uh, it's basically difference between coalitions and networks. Yeah, out, uh, out, uh, uh, other than beliefs, right? So we can identify coalitions based on beliefs. Yeah, other than beliefs. But there, but there might be others. No, that's a good question. So this gets into measurement and also gets into uh, questions of what it means for a coalition to exist almost and what's the nature of those coalitions. Um, and, and so, for example, I, I do think um, you can identify coalitions, you know, the ACF definitionally, definitionally is all about beliefs and the coalitions. And in fact, Paul Sabatier, he was very much geared towards understanding coalitions via the belief system. And so for him, the beliefs were so important in understanding the coalition, coalitions and coalition structures. I'm actually a bit of on the reverse on that. For me, I, I, I know these coalitions exist. I want to understand everything about these coalitions. So, for example, I think in, do, in some situations, if, if you were to measure, let's say, um, interests, um, let's say financial interests, that might be another way of doing this. Sometimes coalitions can be identified um, uh, by even by like, you know, based on like knowledge and let's say their view of like science, perhaps in some, some settings. And so based on, let's say, if you how you kind of um, view the various legitimacy of various scientific perspectives. So that's maybe another way that might work. Um, and some of our, our studies show like, you know, based on who you coordinate with, that might not always be based on belief. Sometimes it's based on shared resources. Um, and so I, I think I think if you were to, do, to describe these coalitions and distinguish them outside of the, like typical beliefs, I would look at interests. I would look at resources as like resource dependency. I'd look at even knowledge and like, like people with shared knowledge, like epistemic communities, if you know that literature. Um, I'd also look at coordination behavior because sometimes, um, you know, we have some data that suggests, especially when conflicts are low, that um, people coordinate with, for reasons outside of their beliefs. And so this could be based on professional, um, uh, professional competency, trust has been shown to be important. Um, um, again, resources is another thing, another reason. 
And so it's, and so it gets into like the meaning of what conflict and perceived threats mean. But we do know that is the higher the threats and the higher the, the feeling of that sense of conflict, police are really important actually. And actually they, they, they get really, really important. But if you bring that down, they become less important. And what's also interesting is that if you're a government official, and this may be, this may depend on context. But in the US, for example, even in a high conflict situation, a government official um, is, is essentially professionally obligated to speak with people on both sides and work with everyone because they're, they're supposed to maintain that, uh, that neutrality. So oftentimes government officials just being in that position of government, so that's that organizational perspective, um, their, that coalition looked a little bit different just because of that organizational um, mission of the government. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, I hope I am, but what we understand is like, okay, so how can we understand these coalitions outside of beliefs? Those are just some of the ideas. But this is also important if, if there's something, um, you know, I can imagine some subsystems also, um, identity could be really, really important. This could be a religious identity, it could be um, uh, sexual orientation, it could be um, issues of race or ethnicity, there's probably some aspects of your identity that probably shapes who you're going to coordinate with or who you're not going to coordinate with. And that actually might, I'm sure it somehow interacts with beliefs, but it's, it's probably a really important factor in, in how these coalitions form. And, and so that's another kind of thing that I would uh, start to look at. You know, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna leave it there, but I hopefully if, uh, Kamar, if I didn't answer your question, please speak up again. It's a good one, and I hope I, I hope I answered it well. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. And I see Ramya has a question. Maybe. Um, hello. Uh, oh. Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm Ramya, a doctoral research scholar in the Department of Political Science. Uh, so, further to the question that you have answered for uh, Kiran. Uh, so I would want to find, or I'm interested in understanding whether these coalitions are so explicitly out there. So when you're trying to look at, like you were quoting the agriculture and the farmers issues and all. So as a researcher in, in the limited resources or the resources that I have, how do, you know, how does one identify the coalitions? Are they so explicitly out there that, you know, you could actually label each part so so easily so is it uh you know uh, like I could yeah. label, okay this is one coalition this is the second coalition this is this coalition and so i i just wanted to find out about this yeah ramya i hope i said your name right good question okay um i think it really depends on like if how much how much resources you have, how much time you have, and so forth, and also even maybe the nature of the subsystem. I'll give you a couple of ways that I've done it, okay, and maybe that'll help. In in, in one in some settings, um, I might, you know, if I live near the area where there's conflict, I might actually either talk to someone or call them on the phone and just talk about what's going on, and I'll ask questions like, hey. Describe the conflict, what's, what's happening here. I hear there's a lot of disagreement on this issue. And the, usually the people were like, oh yeah, I mean, gosh, these scientists, they're, they're, they're advocating for this and these environmental groups want this. And, and I'll write down the names of those scientists and the environmental groups. And they'll say, hey, and, and this government agency is working with these environmental groups too. And then over here, it's these businesses and these associations. And they'll just tell me who's involved and who's not. And I just listen and, and I write it down and I, I almost do a snowball sample. Okay. And I try to develop who's there. And I've, I've done it this way where I've just gone from the bottom up and let them tell me who's on each side and what the nature of the debate is. And I build it from there. Okay. But that takes time actually, because you're talking to people. Sometimes they don't want to talk to you and it, it, it's, it can be kind of intensive. On the other side of it, I've also um, just looked at, I, I started reading newspapers 
Um, I looked at maybe even tweets. I've looked at what people maybe have said at congressional hearings. So I just looked at documents and I start analyzing okay, who, who's on each side. What are they saying? I, and I document it. I write it down. And I almost like draw maps on a piece of paper about who's on each side. And that's a little bit easier sometimes if you have, if you, if, um, if it's not like, you know, if it's a huge issue. It can be really hard, but you know, that that's a, not a bad way to do it also. Um, but, you know, I do think even if you ideally do a little bit of both, right, you'd start with the newspapers and try to understand as much as you can based on the publicly available documents. And then if you get on the phone and talk to like one or two people to confirm what's going on, you, you probably have a good sense of what those coalitions are right there, actually. Um, Rami, is, is that helping you? Okay, good. Yes, thank right. you so much, Professor. Yeah, of course. You know, and, and there's not any single way to do it. I, I will say, you know, if I were to enter a subsystem, the first thing I do is, I, I, you know, well, yeah, usually what I do is I just read as much as I can on Google now and everything else. And then I talk to a few people. And that's usually all, all that it takes to understand the subsystem. And then once I get the idea of generally what's going on, I might do a survey or I might do some formal coding of newspapers or I might code congressional testimony, or I might um, do formal interviews. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can gather that information, bit, you know, depending on, on your setting, okay? Um, but good question, actually. And if I didn't answer it, Rami, if, if you want to email me, I'm happy to kind of engage with you too, if you want, if you have any more questions on that, okay? Sure, sure, thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I can keep going yes, if none. Swan, real good. Okay, I think I'm. By me. Uh, oh I'm okay. yeah. I'm yes. okay yes. Equation. Yeah, I'm okay. I see you. Okay, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, my name is Amok Vinyas. Uh, I'm from. Uh, I'm doing my master's from Department of Political Science. So uh, I I just came across this term called astroturfing a couple of days ago, wherein. Uh, these big corporations appear to take the role of civil society groups claiming to be representing grassroots communities and so on. Mm -hmm. So like in this context wherein, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I'm reminded of uh, this gun rights issue wherein the NRA sort of uh, subsumes the role of speaking on behalf of uh, grassroots interests and gun rights uh, advocacy groups, right? So how should like the government, how should the policymakers sort of navigate between competing interest groups, competing advocacy uh, coalitions, wherein uh, more often than not, they have like antagonistic interests, like the real grassroots communities are impacted by these, uh, you know, antagonist interests. So uh, how, how should the policymakers sort of navigate uh, this conflict? Like, does the framework say anything? Because, uh, you know, the, when the, the very integrity of the coalition itself is questioned, how does the you know, the policymakers engage with them. Is, is there an answer to this in the framework that you're talking about? Does yeah. it engage you with know, this? Good question. So um, we see that a lot um, in the United States, um, this kind of um, astroturfing, I think it's what you, what you, what you said. Um, and we see it in oil and gas, for example, because you can imagine very powerful oil and gas companies uh, in the world, but also in the United States. And we see small little communities here in Colorado, my state, that has oil and gas. And they're trying to um, engage in, you know, these coalitions are trying to engage in these very kind of good local politics. And you see one, sometimes a, a lot of resources coming in from external sources, bumping up the power of one coalition, or those those resources could come in and and build up a coalition that doesn't really even exist, <laughs> right? But maybe it's they're they're um, putting out the tweets, or maybe they're um, you know mo mobilizing various Facebooks, whatever, trying to get a, a coalition to form. Um, and we do see this a lot, actually, and and, and I think that's what you're what you're referring to. You know, what's interesting here, the ACF um, is good, has been good 
at identifying coalitions, and, we're, and actually we're pretty good at doing this. But what, what hasn't been studied enough and needs to be studied, first off, is the resources of those coalitions and where those resources come from. When I say resources, I mean money, I mean scientific technical information, and so forth. Um, and, and the source of that has not been studied. Now, if you're a government official, like a policymaker, and, and um, I, I, think, I think the question then is, as a policymaker, are you trying to be neutral and trying to resolve this conflict? Or are you on one side of this conflict? Because a policymaker, you know, sometimes they're not neutral at all. And so that's also kind of an interesting situation in trying to understand what's the role of the policymaker in, in doing this. And what's also challenging is that sometimes, you know, um, we have, you know, astroturfing, you can imagine this big powerful companies with a lot of money and resources influencing local um, agendas, right? But also oftentimes we have other um, less nefarious activity. You can imagine, let's say, a bunch of university scientists going into a community and identifying a water quality issue and, and mobilizing the public in that community to try to protect their water. But it was actually just a bunch of like low budget scientists who, who are measuring water quality who are pushing this. And a lot of us um, might object to, as I would personally, object to, let's say, a big company with all this money going in there and, 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 and bringing um, a, a policy decision more to their side to kind of reinforce their power. For some reason, that to me doesn't seem ethically right, but a scientist with, you know, trying to support the powerless um, and protect their water, water quality might seem more ethical, at least to me. And so in a way, it's, it is kind of weird to think of, of these communities being interfered with from outside sources, but I think it happens all the time, but it hasn't been studied. And this is one thing that would be really exciting, um, like, you know, maybe yourself or what else, uh, other people, um, to start studying and really to start trying to figure out, okay, so what's the dynamics of who's, of, of essentially power dynamics, but especially getting external, um, getting money or, or resources to, 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 to structure, uh, one side of the debate, or even create it out of nothing, which also happens. Um, the ACF, I mean, sorry, I mean, there's no hypotheses on this at all in the ACF or even theory on it, but we do see it in our research. And no, what all it would take would be one PhD student or one good researcher to say, hey, here's the pattern, let's start looking at this and, and, and developing really our understanding of it. It just hasn't been done yet. Um, so I hope I, I hope I provide at least a, an adequate answer. Probably I, I, I didn't have any like ease. I didn't, you know, obviously I didn't, there's more to it than I just said, but also we don't have great answers either right now. Um, Thank you, sir. And of course, can, any other questions or should I keep going? Hello, oh, good morning, oh. Dr. Uh, uh, Isha here, I had a question. Isha. So uh, my question is about the survey questions uh, that you mentioned. And so whenever I follow Fox News, there's a big uh, feeling of persecution for people. There, there is a feeling the right wing people feel persecuted in the US. So when you ask a question like, are you uh, far leaning towards the left or the right? How accurate is the self-identification? Oh, good, good question. By the way, I think that's snowy on your little label there, isn't it? I think so from Tintin, but maybe I'm wrong. Yes, um, it is snowy from Tintin. <laughs> I'm a I like fan. Tintin. I yeah. Tintin anyway, um, you know, it's a good question. Like, how how accurate is like the liberal conservative viewpoints? You know, and that question isn't the perfect question, but but at least in the United States, when it comes to like a lot of the political identification, um, I think if, if I recall, it's it's sometimes it's the independence in the middle where there's a little bit of measurement error on that. Not measurement error. Like a lot of people will say that they're independent, but they lean right or they lean left. And, but typically they lean right, let's say. They typically are always Republican, they lean left, they're always typically Democrat, but they just kind of claim to be independent in the middle. Um, so it's not, it's definitely not perfect. And ideally we do it other ways. But from our perspective, actually, when you look at the data and you kind of throw into our models, it plays out fairly well. Um, but, but actually, I mean, like, I mean, um, Isha, I think, you know, it's, it is amazing when we look at, uh, um, you know, when you think of coalitions, we, you know, in a way, they're very much like 
political parties. And, and I know the political party system in India, I mean, I, I try to understand it once and maybe someone here on another time can tell me, <laughs> can educate me better. Cause it is, it just seems really complicated um, in your country. And it's complicated here too. But another way, the reason I'm bringing this up is because coalitions are very much like political parties in a way. Although political parties in the US, they're geared more towards elections and overall governance, where, where coalitions are kind of geared more within the subsystem on a particular policy issue. Um, but one thing we learned from political parties is measuring that ideology. And a lot of those ideological questions that they use for political parties, um, like the one I just showed, they're not perfect, but they are usually do an adequate job for coalitions. And actually also just like political parties, sometimes people switch political parties, it's rare, but it happens. And just like coalitions, it's rare, but it happens. Um, but the difference though, is that political parties is, is, you know, there's a list, you sign up for it, you have a badge that says I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. And uh, where coalitions often it's very much informal, which makes it a lot harder to study. But also we're finding, even though they're informal, they're also, um, basically just as stable as, cool, as, as a political party. Um, and then, you know, at least in the United States, the big difference too is that, you know, coalitions, of course, um, as we study them, they're not really that involved in elections, actually. Um, and maybe India, there it would be differently on that. If, if, you know, my naive understanding of India is that political parties are a lot more involved in policy issues up and down the, 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 the governing system than in the United States. And if that's the case, they're, they're going to more likely to be part of coalitions in this country than in the United States. But again, I could be completely wrong on that. I think that makes sense because I feel the first thing that I feel is like you hear a lot, I'm say socially liberal, but fiscally conservative. So I think that makes a lot of sense that it's difficult to place independent candidates. And then again, in a parliamentary uh, democracy like India, coalitions play a big role. So I was very curious to see how I would adapt a survey like this for us. Thank you. Yeah, you, you're welcome, actually. Okay, I'm going to, if someone else has a hand up, please speak up. I'm going to talk a little bit about learning, and then I'm going to um, talk about policy change. So learning, um, you know, basically enduring alterations of beliefs. So again, in the ACF, we have these belief systems, like, you know, our general view of the world. And learning is all basically about how those belief systems get updated and change and so forth. Um, the framework lays out, you know, a couple factors that we think are, you know, supportive of learning. One might be like the attributes of a forum. When I say forum or venue, I mean like it could be like a, a collaborative process. It could be a, a parliamentary process of rulemaking. It could be a, a, a city council. It could be a lot of different venues or forums. But the, the structure of those matter. The level of conflict matters. The higher level of threat the less likely you are to learn from your opponent. I think if you're in a, a, a vicious argument with, with anybody, you're, you're not going to, you're more less likely to learn from them if you're in that argument. Um, and, uh, you know, attributes of the stimuli, so it depends on the type of information and the source of information. And also the, your own beliefs. Are you really extreme in your beliefs? Are you isolated in your network? Uh, do you have a lot of like um, social capital with people that are on the other side of the issue? Um, these are some of the factors we think are conducive to learning. But you know, one thing, oh, and then, of course, then, you know, I talked talk about the archetypical story of, of coalitions. This is what it is for learning. So, again, this is drawn from the general hypotheses in the ACF, but it's basically a little story about, you know, what we think um, is the general theoretical argument for, for, for learning. And the idea is that intense conflicts, these policy actors, will seek information that generally confirms their worldviews and largely discounts, ignores information that counters their worldviews. So basically, you know, we're out there basically looking for information to confirm our beliefs. This leads to reinforcement of beliefs. So basically, I'm going to find beliefs that are kind of reinforce what I think I already know, perhaps reduce uncertainty um, rather than changes. Um, this is going to produce more learning with allies than between opponents. So you're more like learn from your friends than you would from your non-friends. And, um, you know, not everyone's stuck in these worldviews. Um, brokers sometimes help coalitions learn from each other. Sometimes there's people out there who are not advocates, but sometimes their whole kind of purpose is to try to get these coalitions to try to work together better. 
and um, and you know learning between collisions. Yeah, it can happen, and if it does happen, usually it happens at intermediate levels of conflict. Um, often, when there's you know at least common data sources, so let's say they're co-producing information, or let's say if the venue is set up to kind of um, set up a, a good situation for learning. So some of these um, uh, collaborative processes where stakeholders from different sides or these policy actors from different sides can um, learn and negotiate in a way that's kind of fair to each side is, is conducive to learning. But this is the general story, essentially a lot of belief reinforcement and a lot of my data shows this, like people just don't change their beliefs very much. It's not like they don't change their beliefs, but they just, if you know, if one person starts, you know, on one side of the coalition, they're basically going to be reinforcing their beliefs to stay on that side. Um, and, but yeah, there's these brokers that are there and so forth. And, you know, sometimes learning does happen, but you know, not very often. Um, and again, these are drawn from, if you open up the ACF book or the ACF chapter in the theories book, you'll get the hypotheses and these are the hypotheses. I'm not going to go through these too much. The story I just said basically is essentially these hypotheses condensed into something a little more digestible, I hope, anyway. Now, the challenge with learning, though, is how to measure it. It's so hard. And, and, and the questions I'm going to show you here aren't that even of good questions, but I don't, you know, I'm pretty critical when it comes to the ACF and a lot of things, actually. Um, but none of us have really analyzed uh, learning, I, I think, that well. And these are some of the questions that I've tried. You know, I've tried a lot of different things. I've, I've, I've asked questions like, hey, when you first became involved in like oil and gas, what were your views on the following things, the economic benefits and so forth? You know, and what's your current position? So it's almost, this is self-reported learning. So did you, um, how did you feel back then? How did you feel now? But again, this is not a panel. This is not two surveys. This is the same survey. And of course, you know, you get, you know, these are actually statistically significant changes on a couple of them. But really, if you look at the, the changes in the mean overall, it's not a lot of like change on, uh, on self-reported surveys. What's also interesting, I do have some panel data. So the same people answering the same survey over a six year period. And, and for the most part, um, this is just, hey, what do you believe in this? You know, do you believe in fracking in this time period? Do you believe it in this time period, in this time period? And if you look at that over time, you get very little changes in, um, in beliefs. Um, it does happen, but for the most part, people are kind of stable. Uh, at least the people that we've looked at and what I've seen in the literature. This is a, a, from the New York survey we did in 2013. You know, I also have done work on aquaculture in the past. And instead of asking people, you know, what they believe back, you know, things, you know, in, you know, two years ago to what they believe today, here I just asked, hey, as you engage in this partnership, this is a, a partnership. How much better understanding have you have you um, have you gotten? And so each of these little dots, you know, plus two is like I strongly agree. I learned a lot. Negative two, I learned nothing at all. It was a waste of time. Um, and each of these these ten groups are the ten partnerships. These are collaborative groups, and you know, for the most part, everybody said they learned something. The dots are people, and some partnerships they learn more than others um, overall. But uh, you do see a spread, but yeah, people said they, they learned something uh, or they gained knowledge. And of course you can also, you know, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. This is a publication, happy to share it with you. But as I mentioned before, it's, it's the rules of these, this is partnership traits, but these are the, really the rules of the partnership, rules of the collaborative group um, or the norms of the collaborative group matter. And also the individual traits matter. For example, people who participate for a long period of time, learn, you know, say they learn more. Um, and, you know, um, actually, you know, if there's lack of scientific certainty, you're more likely to learn too, which is also kind of counterintuitive. So the more scientific certainty there is, the less likely they are to learn. So maybe there's something about the need to learn. Um, but again, I happen to show this, you know, I don't think we've done a good job of learning uh, and measuring learning. Um, part of the challenge is how do you conceptualize it and measure it? There's a lot of examples out there, but it's just hard to do, actually. Um, and it's hard to compare the findings. Um, sometimes you think it's learning cognitive. Is it behavioral? Is it both? What comes first? That's come up. 
well, let's say it's facilitate learning, um, level of conflict we know matters, brokers and learning matters, and the role of certainty and uncertainty. Like my last data I showed, sometimes or we do have evidence that suggests, you know, almost counterintuitive. If there's a lot of uncertainty in the area, people are more likely to learn. If people think it's everything certain, they're less likely to learn. But a lot of that's just kind of speculation. Um, and so, as I said, it's really hard to measure learning, you know, and, and uh, you know, a lot of times it's self-reported, sometimes it's, it's observational, um, but it's just really hard. And that's something that we struggle with um, in this field and it's something that uh, hopefully we'll get better with over time. Um, and, you know, can we be confident that this changes in state of position, like a newspaper, is that learning? Or is that just them being strategic in how they frame something? Um, but we do have some lessons, you know, for the most part, beliefs tend to be remain stable over time. We have a lot of evidence on that. Um, but change happens. I can talk about some of that if you want. Uh, reinforcement is a predominant pattern. And, and that's actually, uh, reinforcement's actually, I, I think, really important um, um, aspect of, of any policy process or any political system. And that, you know, sometimes just, you know, the more reinforced your beliefs are, Sometimes the lower your, you know, you basically you become more certain. You lower your transaction costs for maybe searching for information, and you just become more confident in what you're doing. So there's nothing wrong with reinforcement, but it definitely isn't necessarily a change in position if that's what you're looking for. The rules can facilitate learning. We know this. Um, high conflict uh, coincides with higher centrality of experts as coalition allies and opponents. There's also interesting, a good amount of, some data suggests that the higher the conflict, the more likely scientists are brought in into these debates to kind of almost like they're the, they're the supplier of the information weapons that kind of fuel each of the coalitions. And so if you lower the conflict, the, co the scientists become less and less important. It's also kind of interesting. So the higher conflict, the more scientists are there, the less conflict, they're not quite as central. Um, it's almost like they don't need them. Uh, Learning is often associated with need. So again, the scientific uncertainty argument. And uh, again, reinforcement, I guess that's a dominant, that's just a repeat there. I don't need that final bullet. Reinforcement's just there all the time. Okay, so that's kind of the end of the learning section. Is there any questions on that or should I keep on going on to the policy change? I keep going on. If people have questions, please speak up because I sometimes I have a hard time seeing this. Um, on policy change, so um, what's, the, what's the archetypical story of policy change in the ASF, just like it did for learning and, and coalitions? This is basically drawn from the uh, hypotheses. And first off, there's always resistance to policy change, um, partly because it's a reflection of the, the rigid beliefs that people have. And so there needs to be a lot of force to overcome it. And this force can be driven by one or more coalitions. So there has to be a coalition exploiting some sort of shock or event, like an internal shock or an external shock. Um, and I'll talk about what those mean here in a sec. A hurting stalemate, so that's when the coalitions just get tired of fighting each other and they decide to negotiate. And sometimes learning accumulates and um, they just want to change policy. Oftentimes it's incremental, but not always. And, and also policy change can be any combination of these. And sometimes these, these events don't always lead to policy change. Nothing's guaranteed. Um, you know, ACF does make a distinction between internal and external shocks. This is in reference to the subsystem. So for example, if there were, um, uh, you know, let's say, um, a, a, you know, a, a, a new, you know, back in whatever year that was, um, um, the nuclear, and I, I'm maybe too late in the day here, but the nuclear accident that happened in Japan about 10 years ago um, was a, a, an internal shock to the energy system in Japan. It was a meltdown of a nuclear plant in Japan, but that was an external shock to um, a lot of other energy systems in other countries, let's say in Switzerland, that decided to kind of, if I understand this right, um, zero out their nuclear power in that country and after that event happened. So, so an internal event is one that happened in the subsystem, in the country or in the, in, in the same area that's usually blamed for something within that subsystem. An external event is one that happened in another subsystem that we're learning from. But usually 
both of those can be, needs to be capitalized by a coalition. In fact, all these three need to be kind of driven by a coalition exploiting it. Oops, excuse me. But this is the general story of, of essentially how policy changes in the ACI. And, um, you know, policy change definitionally is any type of change in policy. Um, usually it's formal, like legislation or regulation, um, or informal. It could be street level bureaucrats, but typically we focus on the formal. Um, and as I kind of mentioned, some combination of learning, negotiated agreements, internal shocks, external shocks. And these pathways must be exploited by a coalition. And, you know, the ACF does make a distinction between major and minor change, major being changes in the policy core of a subsystem, like the goals of it, and minor being like how they achieve it. Um, that's very much if you're familiar with, I think, Peter Hall's work on paradigms, somewhat similar there. Um, but these are just, this is basically the, the hypotheses kind of rewritten in the ACF, that the ACF talks about in, on, 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 on policy change. And in terms of the evidence, you know, it's not, this is not necessarily like anything groundbreaking, but there's, I would say that there's gazillion, I say gazillion, there's many, many, many cases that, say these four pathways usually somehow always kind of present. But that's also not saying exactly a lot because you're always going to see some sort of shock. You're always going to see some sort of learning. Yeah, oftentimes you see some sort of negotiation. They're pretty broad categories, actually. Um, but, but usually you can always find one, and usually they kind of cascade. So oftentimes there's an external shock. Sometimes there's learning that goes on. And sometimes there's negotiation. And then there's policy change, and, and sometimes you see that sort of pattern. But I think the more important question is, you know, when, how, why, and what um, about the policy change when it happens or when it doesn't happen. Um, and so that's something that um, we just need to work on because we know there's a lot of, like, these four pathways. You can find documentation of them existing, but you just don't find the policy change. But it's rare to find policy change without one of these four pathways existing. Um, you know, if, if, you know, you do a uh, few cases to talk about how policy change can also be oops, preceded by changes in coalitions. And so um, sometimes this could send to, um, sometimes you have like uh, some sort of shock. Maybe this is the astroturf argument that was made earlier where a lot of resources are going into a community and a subsystem that changes the coalitional structure. One coalition gets really powerful and change can happen. And that's kind of the, the and that might not, you know, maybe that's related to one of the four pathways, but there's a couple of publications on that. Um, and I would also say most studies of policy change are qualitative case studies. They involve process tracing. They usually they pick one aspect of the case study and they try to understand the events that preceded it. It's not, um, it's, it's usually, um, at least in the ACF, it's usually how it's done, which is fine, um, actually. Uh, you know, just as an example, you know, I did work, uh, Sojin and, and Kyung Dong are two of my PhD students um, they're from South Korea. And we looked at, I forget exactly how many Korean applications we looked at, I think nearly 80 South Korean applications. And, and you know South Korea better than I do. Centralized, uh, these are centralized subsystems, being a, a unitary country as it is. Oftentimes there's a dominant coalition aligned with the central government in South Korea. Um, administrative agencies typically were uh, principal coalition members, um, not a lot of nonprofits as much as compared to the U.S. And patterns related to policy change in this country, you know, we we noticed um, a lot due to changes in the governing coalition. So this is um, when we say governing coalition, basically essentially in Korea, the party that's involved. And because in South Korea, there's elections every five years, you get uh, rapid changes at the national level because it's a unitary system that leads to a lot of changes in subsystems and a lot of changes um, in the country. And so you have less, at least this is what they reported, less to learning, less to negotiated agreements between the coalitions. Um, and, and also we found in that country that a lot of people mentioned external shocks. And we just think it's, um, well, here it's especially shifts in public opinion, socioeconomic conditions, in part because of the rapid um, development of South Korea, especially through the 1980s and 90s. Um, but, you know, these are some of the patterns that we found in the South Korean case studies. And so this is interesting because, you know, you know, what we don't know is, is, for example, okay, so is this different than, let's say, what we might expect in India? Is it different than what we might expect in the U.S.? And, you know, I think, you know, it makes sense that it, that certain patterns in South Korea would generate what I just said, given the structure of the government and the culture and everything else. 
And you might expect that India might have different patterns if we generated enough publications, let's say 80 applications, maybe have a slightly different pattern in India. Um, but also there's a lot of examples in South Korea that look a lot like the United States as an example. And maybe that's okay too. Um, but what's interesting, you know, Kim Dong um, Park, he's, he's a professor now in uh, South Korea University. And, you know, I think one of his career goals is to try to like keep developing this literature in South Korea and, and picking up the dominant patterns of uh, policy processes and subsystems involving coalitions, learning and policy change in that country to understand it's kind of like its footprint. You know, and one of my you know, objectives talking to you is, you know, hopefully, you know, we can do the same thing in India and understand a lot more about the Indian context and 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 and, and what what patterns emerge there that perhaps are very similar to, let's say, the United States or other, um, let's say, Westminster style structures of government um, versus others. Um, so the big question is, you know, policy change means what? What type of what type of change? The content of the change. Um, you know, sometimes we um, need to focus, well, we need to start, start talking more about the type of venue that the change happens in and, and the patterns. Uh, oftentimes we don't, you know, sometimes, you know, people do kind of emphasize different parts of the ACF. So if you're doing an, a, a, cool, a policy change study, you might focus all this work on policy change, but you might focus less on coalitions. And, and so there's a bit of an imbalance and sometimes you need to do both. And we don't have a lot of studies actually that do a good job of coalition structure and behavior and policy change. Um, and also what happens after policy change is the next one. Um, you know, we do need to develop good research designs for policy change, we're just not even starting there. And also major and minor change. Like what's the meaning and importance of that? Uh, I mean, I've, I've looked at 55 policy instances of policy change in Colorado and fracking, I've looked at them. And, it's, and I know this topic well in the state of fracking and oil and gas development, and I have a hard time saying this is major change, this is minor change. Um, I, it's just, it's really complicated when you get into the weeds of the text and, and, and everything else. Um, so it's easy to write in the ACF definitionally, harder to really identify out there in the field. Um, so, so, Dan, so, so, um, yeah, so these are some of the things that, you know, I guess we've done to kind of advance the ACF scholarship that, you know, maybe you can then, we know, meta reviews are good. I don't know how many applications of the ACF are in India. Um, you know, actually, we did one media analysis. We, I had a grant where we, we looked at you know, sustainable cities and I worked with some Indian scholars. And, you know, we, we did some work on air pollution um, in India, but I mean, I don't think that's that was necessarily a good application, but, you know, for example, Jang et al. That's we did the meta review of all applications in, in South Korea. Norstedt and Olofsson did Sweden. I did China with um, Wei Li. I have a student looking at all ACF applications actually in the continent of Africa right now. Um, and so from here, we're trying to pick up certain patterns in different parts of the world. Um, you know, we're, we need to start connecting coalitions, learning, and policy change. Um, develop tailored theoretical relationships. When I say tailored, I do think. The ACF has a potential to be applied in India and, and not to be dictated to say, hey, this is what it should be, but really, as, hey, as a framework, so I can work with US scholars and we can have more of an exchange. And of course, we need best practices for conceptualization, measurement, and analysis. Um, and that's hard because it's applied in so many different contexts in so many different ways. It's hard to find, let's say, hey, this is um, a good measurement tool because um, we are, it is a contextually based framework. But at the same time, we also need to think comparatively. And so I think some of the best advances we've had is when there's been small teams working together in different parts of the world, um, learning to each other, but coordinating the results at the same time. And uh, this is the last slide, five general lessons from the ACF program. One, um, I think it is important to think the framework theory distinction. Um, the ACF as a framework is portable, I think, to India. The theories, I think, may need to be adapted, and I think that's okay, and that's something that um, hopefully some of you will do and um, as you go forward if you want to apply it. I would say avoid the two variable hypotheses. Sometimes we get so stuck on it. X goes up, Y goes down. It's very simplified relationships. Um, and I think it's way more better to think of maybe perhaps these kind of more bigger stories. This is what we kind of expect the general pattern will be. Um, and also contextualize those more. 
um, invest in the restricted community, which means, um, you know, organize, you know, you know, in the ACF, we've done a really good job of organizing comparative research. And so this is, um, you know, like I organized this fracking book. We had an eight country comparison, all the scholars working together. We were syncing our results and so forth. Um, we just need more of that. And we've had some good success doing that so far. Um, you know, uh, develop and not force uh, common forms of data collection. You know, I, as I mentioned before, um, we've had some success on this, but, you know, we need portability, but we don't want to be kind of um, force like one survey on everybody. It just would not be good. But we do need some sort of commonality that we don't have right now. And finally, you know, embrace time and effort um, for the progress. Because this framework's been around for like 40 years. It's a long time. And we've We've made good progress, but actually, we have a long ways to go. And I think we're right now. We have a wonderful community. Um, I, I really like hanging out with a lot of the scholars that do this sort of work. Um, and so, if you're interested, you know, join it. It's it's actually kind of um, fun. And actually, it's not like I do only ACF work. I think probably it's about 20% of my research right now. I, I do a lot of other things, but it's always fun to go to conferences and be on the panel with other scholars doing this sort of work. We always learn from each other and so forth. That's basically it. Um, I'm happy to take your questions. Um, we have a little bit of time left, um, but hopefully that was worth your time. Yeah, can, can I take a very quick, uh, can I uh, you know, ask you a very quick question, if you don't mind, Chris? Of course. Yeah, you see, uh, in policy tracing, you see, uh, if you were to predict the ripeness of coalition, advocacy coalitions, uh, how how would you go about this? Given that, for example, in India and for that matter in the United States, there is fundamental disagreement about basic core beliefs. Okay, and also given that the way in which the off-handed way in which opposition coalitions are treated very severely in these places, especially uh, during the Trump administration in the U.S. and and for that matter now in India, there are very high chances of coalitions not building up, right? And what would be the possibility of alternative policy for framework emerging? That's one. Given that, one, you have most of the information flows which are either fudged or manipulated, or you have simply do not have information which are credible to, uh, in order for coalitions to emerge, in, in fact, in, for coalitions to emerge, you have to have certain information uh, flow, information, and the credible information flows, which simply is not the case because we live in a post truth world, you know, which is increasingly very difficult for coalitions to emerge. So, this is one part. So, in, in such situation, in such scenario, what is the rightness of advocacy coalitions? Do advocacy coalitions have at all? a chance of being actualized that's one okay secondly in terms of the uh, the way in which these advocacy coalitions navigate certain policy frameworks to uh, to to actualize in the long run in terms of effective policy change there are so many roadblocks now given that you have fundamental shift in the terms of political discourse you have both the you know the kind of internal networks which in effect are overwhelmed for example in the context of india by the right leading uh, you know civil activist organization which simply sent out any possibility of alternative policy framework to emerge so in such case do you see any possibility of credible advocacy coalitions which might affect you know, credible policy shift or credible policies change all the time. Hmm. Professor Swan, those are good questions. I'm just gonna, let me start with the first one. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tackle it because I, 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 I hear that question and there's a couple dimensions to it. But one dimension that, you know, um, a lot of my research right now is on policy and democracy, for example. And I'm starting to apply the ACF to questions of, to more questions involving power and the powerless and representation. And I think, and so part of what you're saying is, so what happens when there's 
you mentioned not enough information for these coalitions to say to form from understanding you right. And, and what happens when there's suppression or, or the lack of the opportunity structures to form? And, and I think, I think there's, there's a couple of things there. One is, um, you know, I, the ACF has not been applied really at all to understanding issues of political equity and, and, and representation. So we have these coalitions that have formed, let's say, in the United States. But who do they represent and who do they do not represent and whose voices are not heard? And no one's asking these questions. And this is something that, especially in the United States, I'm sure in India too, with, with the Trump presidency, but also just the massive economic inequalities we see in our country right now, and, and, and everything from Black Lives Matter to issues of, of immigration and, 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 and political voice. Um, these are questions that, that we need to start asking about, about who's there and who's not there. I mean, who who's, has a voice in this process? Who's being represented, who's not? And, and so, so first off, I think Swan, Professor Swan, I think that's, you're getting that part, I think you're getting at some of this. And this is something that I have, I personally care about, but it's also something that just hasn't been studied. And I think, I think and, and what's challenging about it is that we, okay, so now, you know, we know how to identify coalitions. So how can we start thinking about questions of, okay, who do these coalitions represent? And we have to start looking at, okay, so what do we do when we look at a subsystem where it's one dominant coalition and the minority coalition just can't even form and there's no representation. There's not even like a coalition there but you know that there's people negatively impacted by the policy. How do we deal with that? And, and this gets into, I think, the role of all, I think everyone on this call is, uh, we need to start thinking about what's our role as researchers to really identify those voices that don't have a voice or don't have power and, and really perhaps bring to light the fact that in a democracy, they should have some say. And I, I do think as researchers, like in fracking, we do, we do this a lot. We do not take a position on oil and gas. We do not say you should frack or not frack. But what we do do is say, this process adheres to basic democratic norms. And if we think of basic democratic norms as basically all citizens in society should have some say in a policy, then we can say, okay, so who doesn't have a say that should have a say? And so I think we can, the, apply the framework in that regard, but it would require, um, it, it would just require, take the framework, you just need to bring into that framework um, issues of political equity, political, uh, social equity, representation, and a lot of more questions about just questions of pure power and democracy. And that's kind of where I'm going with my research, at least in the near future. And I think it's uh, really needed, especially in these times when you see so much suppression of ideas and also, what's interesting too, you brought up this idea of, of we are in a post-factual world um, and how that plays into this too. But also, you know, and, and of course the Trump era was, was very challenging. Um, the, um, what's interesting though is like, you know, I've looked at subsystems and I have data that goes back 50 years now and, and science has always been politicized. And so I, I think, What's different now is that you, first of all, it was politicized by the president more so than ever has been. Um, but this gets into like, you know, I, th I think people are just, you know, in a way it doesn't, the ACF would kind of predict this actually, because you're driven by beliefs, you're ignoring some information, you pay attention to others. They're, but the strategy for doing this is just saying, instead of saying, um, I don't believe your information. They, they basically come up with their own facts, whatever they do in terms of this post-factual world. So it is a challenging how, how these kind of analytical debates have changed. Because, but my point, I guess, is that the analytical, analytical debates between coalitions, at least in our data, has always been there. And, and so it's, it's just more intense now. So I, that, that I'm less concerned about. But I, I do think we need to start looking at the post-factualness of these debates and how we handle them. And even today we were thinking about analyzing discourse and we're like, okay, are we going to fact check the discourse or are we just gonna take the discourse as is and analyze it to understand the stories they're telling? And, and we didn't really come up with a solution to this, um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting question. 
Um, so I, I don't know, Dr. Swan, I, I don't know if I got your first part right, but I guess in general, I would say we need to start looking at questions of suppression and power and whose voice isn't there. And we haven't done it yet. Um, and that's something that just needs to be done. And I'll, I'm jumping into it now. Your second question is like, okay, how do we, if I recall, um, how do we think about credible coalitions leading to policy change? And this is, this is also interesting because in the ACF world, and I don't like this, but you know, the ACF emerged in the United States at a time when you know, public policy was being, was, was not respected by political scientists for almost being too normative. And Paul Sabatier drew a hard line and said, we are doing science for science sake. And he didn't take a lot of positions on things. And so in the ACF, there's no hypotheses. There's nothing about one coalition being more credible than the other one. Nothing about a po this policy change is good policy change or negative policy change. Um, this coalition is for the good, this one's for the bad. Um, and I think that's actually, actually it's kind of not good, but also solving that is also quite hard. And this is where for me, I, I go back to just basic, you know, I'm trying to bring in just basic democratic norms more into the ACF because I, I can't always say that this policy positions are better than the other, but I think I can say this process adheres to more democratic norms than others. And, and I think, I think that could be brought into the ACF more than it has been. Um, and, and I would say even, you know, for people who are political scientists, it's all part of the education. But at least in the US, when people study often public policy, they don't get exposed to a lot of political science. And I think that's really, really problematic when it comes to power of democracy and these sort of things. So hopefully we'll move that, move that forward. So I guess Dr. Swan, I, I, don't, I don't know if I actually answered all your questions uh, in a way that's satisfying, but, um, but I will say your questions are ones that I'm pondering. I think if I'm understanding them, I'm pondering a lot myself actually. So I'm happy to engage with you more on them. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah uh, 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 Christopher, uh, see, at least uh, three questions to uh, have. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, as a result of impact of uh, policy cycle approach, uh, more specifically in the Indian context, uh, the policy making institutions have been designed in such a manner to follow all the stages of uh, policy cycle approach. Say, for example, Center for Policy Agenda, Center for Planning, formula, Policy Formulation, Center for uh, monitoring, center for evaluation and impact assessment, etc. So if you ask you a question that too. so in the in the light of rise of ACF, what say sort of changes do you recommend in order to bring about the existing the uh, policy cycle approach place? What are the kind of changes that you suggest for uh, policy making institutions? That is the one question number one. Uh, uh, second one is that, uh, see, when I, uh, whenever I am making an, an effort to impart academic knowledge about the ACF, at least two questions, uh, two issues I have been encountering. One is from uh, uh, conceptual and terminological, and the second is that uh, empirical context. So, what is the way out to, to come out from this uh, uh, concept, uh, concepts and the terminology that is being used and then empirical context? And the third one is that uh, you refer this discourse analysis as a uh, tool to understand the uh, policy change. So uh, uh, let me uh, put this question while illustrated into one of the long standing public policy in India, which has got more than 130 years. Uh, that is known as the reservation policy, or it is also known as affirmative action policy or special treatment. And I think it is also existing in the US as well. Uh, so it has uh, it was started during the colonial period still it has been continued so when you look at the discourse during colonial period or in the post independent period at the time of drafting of the constitution and what it has been from 2010 onwards see the group in a hierarchically structured social system that reservation affirmative action policies meant for the lowest rank of the society but today at the the toppest so, uh, social order of this society has been demanding for the reservation policy, which was the social group which has opposed in 1950s, 60s and 70s. But they now also demand for the reservation policy. 
how do we characterize is it a formation of a coalition group coalition formation or something else this is somewhat a, a enigmatic question for me thank you hmm. those are tough those are tough questions you know i guess if i if going to the first one um the policy the policy cycle and especially if we have let's say various government entities structured around it there's nothing wrong with the policy cycle by itself um well i should rephrase that the policy cycle is 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 very useful if you think of it as a very linear process um and and so you have these entities this capacity let's say focusing on formulation implementation and evaluation there's capacity there to inform the policy process the limitation would be that the policy process is way more messier than those four or five let's say different parts of the cycle um and so what you want is is some entities that operates let's say actually at the subsystem level that that basically integrates and, and coordinates across the policies those different um, stages of the policy cycle and and in, in doing so um, you'd probably uh, help with the intersectionality between them that will always be there and help with the coordination between them too and you might also um, capitalize on let's say groups capitalizing on some aspects of the cycle more than others especially there's some sort of like entity that helped kind of um, capture or represent the um, uh, the their interdependencies because those cycles those different aspects of the policy cycle are um, are not independent right they're very much interdependent and so you'd want some sort of mechanism to kind of capture that or somehow represent that um, so no one either so either to kind of lower the transaction costs or to avoid basically one group dominating all of them through some sort of um, uh, you know uh, uh, use, use of power and so forth and so that's that's what I would say is is basically organized you want some sort of entity that kind of helps deal with the interdependencies um, the second question is um, if I recall um, um, well I'm gonna go to the third one too which basically deals with the discourse of these coalitions and identifying coalitions via discourse and how we um, make sense of them um, through that discourse over time. Um, you know, it's kind of, it is kind of funny, it depends on your goals and your objectives and, and everything else. And, and maybe I'm not understanding everything in your question, but you know, understanding discourse of coalitions can be really, really good for understanding, let's say the nature of the debate, um, the priorities that they mentioned, um, the extent that perhaps they're picking up the different um, uh, arguments of the other side or, or, or not, um, and how that changes over time, because oftentimes we can analyze it over time. And we can also associate with, with, with policy change, but it's not very good at, at trying to explain that policy change by itself. And there are limitations to it, but what you can do, as I think you were leaning at, is you can get at um, how these coalitions um, do change over time and, 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 but you have to be kind of careful to look at the, especially if you do it for 50 years and when the, when the terms change and everything else, it's not an easy thing to do, but, but it is something that we can do. And sometimes it's really important to do. Um, and, you know, and just to kind of get back to, I think your second question relates to, um, just these rule of concepts and measuring concepts across con context. And, and I, I might, um, be forgetting some aspects of this, of your question there. But this is the thing. So, I mean, the ACF has the concepts are generally pretty um, um, flexibly defined. So you can measure, let's say, deep core beliefs um, in India very differently than you would in the United States. And that's what it was designed for. The very general categories. Um, and and um, so ideally you do that and, and it gives you that flexibility to do that and to kind of adapt to the concepts, adapt it to the context, which means you get to kind of do some background research there. Um, I don't see any problem with that. I mean, the, I mean, we don't want the concepts to be so rigid that um, that we're not paying attention to the, con the context. And at the same time, we don't want um, all the research to be, you know, completely different across contexts. But the, but the general categories, I mean, 
my, my, my take is that they, they provide some flexibility to um, enable comparisons, but also, um, you know, set specific contextual analysis. So, you know, I guess that's my take on that. Hopefully um, I answered your question and, and thank you for them. And, and you know, I, um, it's been wonderful being here, <laughs> but, um, you know, these are also really deep questions you're asking. So I'd love to engage with them more and, um, um, perhaps another time and maybe after the pandemic's over in person. Um, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Um, so if there aren't any questions, uh, say, first of all, we are uh, really uh, thankful to uh, Professor Christopher for his uh, uh, energizing uh, talk and to understand this uh, to in the uh, to understand this ACF in the in the light of Indian context uh, it is uh, quite uh, motivating and inspiring talk and probably we'll be have we will be continuing this uh, connection or the, uh, our research activity in the days to come and uh, in fact it has uh, your talk has uh, clarified so many doubts so many clarifications in fact for the last uh, five years i have been now uh, focusing on this uh, acf and trying to uh, discuss about it with the academic community and now some clarity uh, we have got it and of course we have a group of people have produced a lot of literature in the world i think this framework it was started with uh, some environmental aspect but today its nature and scope has been expanded even in indian context also in some of the cases it has been applied it is applied and the literature has been produced but it is an, at a minute level but still it needs to be taken to the uh, in a serious uh, academic uh, uh, platform because still the traditional concepts or frameworks have been uh, dominating but uh, this is a one breakthrough we are trying in this we are in this process of uh, uh, taking acf to uh, developing societies like India to enrich the application part as well as the literature to produce. So, uh, Professor Swan, do you have anything to say? Uh, nothing much. Uh, just to thank uh, Professor Weibel for his excellent presentation uh, and uh, for agreeing to, uh, to be with us. Uh, we have pushed him till midnight now. I, I, I think he's beyond his usual timing of uh, getting to bed. So. Uh, thank you yeah. so much. Uh, we have really benefited from your presentation. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, thank Ramea, you so much for the invitation. Uh, Ramea, uh, yeah. I'm here also. Yes. Uh, Ramea, uh, would you propose the word of thanks? Yeah. So, a uh, very good afternoon, everybody, and uh, good evening, Professor Weibel. Uh, so, on behalf of the Department of Political Science, University of Hyderabad, I express my sincere gratitude to Professor Christopher Weibel for readily agreeing to have shared his inputs and insights uh, on the advocacy coalition framework. And uh, yes, we would have really been glad to have hosted you at our campus in Hyderabad and would have actually filled your entire day with many, many more questions. <laughs> and uh, yes, probably when the world gets better, probably one day we would love to have you know, host you on our campus. And on behalf of the students, I deem it as a great opportunity to hear it from the author himself, who we very often find in our articles and, uh, you know, lectures. It is in fact like the author coming out of the text and making it very comprehensive, uh, especially the aspects like that policy subsystem diagram, which in the first instinct looks like a very complex uh, a figure and uh, how the application of ACF works and the concept of ACF and uh, the relevance of it for democratic systems like India. And uh, I'm very confident that it has been a very enriching experience for us, especially the students, to comprehend the concept better. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Christopher Weibel, for this opportunity of you know listening to you and getting to know the concept better and uh, enthusing a lot of more interest in this aspect. And uh, I also would like to thank Professor Kamkan Suan Hossing for all his support. And uh, I'm really very thankful to Professor Venkateshu for this initiative and for this opportunity of uh, listening to a great theoretician in public policy. 
and uh, lastly i thank all the student and researchers of the department of political science for their participation and uh, for their inputs and for their inquiries with uh, professor christopher wabel thank you so much once again to all of you and uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening uh, professor mm -hmm. christopher thank you so much that was so wonderful and uh, i do hope this our, our interactions will continue but um, it's been great, actually. And thank you for the great questions and hard questions. And of course, if anybody wants to apply the ACF in India or elsewhere, please reach out, I'm happy to help out. Um, and uh, so I am available. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good night. <laughs> have a good I'm, going to, I'm, yeah. I'm going to bed. <laughs> have a good rest as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.